Okay. Um, so I just wanted to go through the last weeks of the semester. <laughs> we're almost there. Um, so this week we're on week 14 and we're going to be talking about ANCOVAs and MANOVAs. Um, activity nine will be uh, based on, I'll give you guys outputs for um, different types of tests and pretty much you're just responding to questions um, based on research scenarios and the output. So nothing too different from previous weeks. And then we're also going to be doing um, kind of a round on evaluating statistics in research. So I am required to participate in a journal club for my PhD program. And we read a different um, article every single week and have to break it down, criticize the methodology. Um, a lot of times it's criticizing their statistics or what they chose to report. Um, so I picked out five articles. Um, I think in the activity, I'm only asking you guys to read two, uh, but pretty much what you're doing is just pulling out pieces of information from the article. So it's and then there's like a little part where at the end where you're gonna, you know, like criticize the methodology. I know the activity, some of you might have previewed it and you're like, oh my God, it's 96 points. Like, it seems like a lot, but it also allows you to miss more points um, without taking a hit to your grade. So um, yeah, that's the activity for this week. Next week, we are reviewing for exam three. I know it seems like it came up really, really quickly, um, uh, but we'll have a set of review questions for you. Uh, per usual, there will be uh, a review quiz that is optional for extra credit. Um, so you, you may or may not decide to do that, but it'll be solely based on the questions that we cover in the review uh, session. And then activity 10 is a review activity. So because we're not learning anything new next week, that will pretty much cover um, our factorial ANOVAs, specifically two-way ANOVAs. So the between, 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 within, and within, within um, examples. And then we'll also have a couple examples of ANCOVA and MANOVA on there. So you get another practice round on those as well. So lots of review opportunities next week. Um, and then, I just want, I pulled up this schedule because I wanted to point out that the exam date is different than previous exams. So in order to give myself um, a couple of days to grade your activity, I usually try to turn around your activity within a day um, before exam three. That way you have some feedback on the review uh, component of that activity. So the exam will be Wednesday instead of a Monday. Um, you still have between 8 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. to take the exam. If you have a work schedule or another class that like absolutely conflicts and you do not have a three hour period in the day um, to sit down to devote to the exam, please let me know and we'll try to like work out an alternative day during that week for you to complete um, that test. Um, and then pretty much after the exam, I try to grade those within two days. So the turnaround time is pretty quick. That way I can let you guys know what your final grade in the class is. Um, and then if you decide that you wanna take the final exam to cancel out one of your previous exam scores, you have that option. But I, I will email each of you individually letting you know what your options are. So you can have peace of mind if you are done with this class and you never have to think about stats again, um, or you might have to think about it for another week, but um, yeah, so you, you'll have options. And then if you decide to take the final exam, it'll be Tuesday, um, or it'll be open Tuesday, May 11th, starting at 8 a.m. and will close Wednesday, May 12th at 11.59 p.m. Um, and you just find regular, you're allotted three hours, you find a time frame that works best for you and then you're good to go. I do have one um, thing to note that I will be traveling back to California on the 12th. Um, 
I do have like a six hour layover between flights. So for the most part, I, I feel like I should be pretty much available to answer questions when you guys would be taking the exam. Um, so hopefully that doesn't create any conflicts, but I will try to be as responsive as possible. In the past, only a handful of people usually need to take the final. So I'm hoping it won't be an issue, but anybody have any questions on kind of our final schedule over the last three, four weeks. I feel like it's, it's a good plan for now. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna do a new share. Um, let's, let's see, how do we Zoom? It's been a couple weeks. Um, oh, and the frame isn't right. Anyway, my theme for this week was sleep, because um, it seems like for most of us, there has been a lack of it. <laughs> um, so this is, Squidward is a mood. Just want to put that out there. Um, but this is me after my alarm has already gone off six times. I personally usually set an alarm every 15 minutes over the span of like an hour and a half. So I sleep like the dead. Um, anyway. Uh, did you sleep well? Me. And then you have a cute little kitty cat. So adorable. I know, Butter. Exactly. She's been very vocal today, so hopefully she doesn't um, interrupt too much um, like she's doing right now. Yeah, we can all laugh at her. It's fine. <laughs> um, and then here's my last one. You're almost done with the semester. Just finish strong. Me finishing strong. You guys are doing great. Anyways, actually, I feel like this is really relatable for me with the teary eyes because I got less than desirable news before class and had a cry sesh for like 30 minutes. But you guys are like one of the best parts of my Monday. So I wanted to be here. But you're doing great. <laughs> OK, let's get down to business. Um, so again, this week, uh, we're covering ANCOVAs, which is analysis of covariance. So just to make ANOVAs more complicated, woohoo. Um, and then we're going to be doing MANOVAs, which is a multiple or multivariate analysis of variance. Um, and then we'll do kind of a very, very short discussion on evaluating scientific literature. We've kind of covered this back at the beginning of the semester when we talked about threats to internal and external validity. But um, I think it now that you guys have been exposed to a lot of different uh, statistical tests, it's kind of nice to revisit that uh, to see how people actually apply everything you've learned this semester in research. So. Um, I feel like last semester the lecture was over in about an hour so. Um, if we have some extra time at the end, I would be happy to answer any questions on the activity if you guys got stuck on anything. Okay. Um, being that classes have been online the last couple of semesters, I haven't asked students to learn how to process ANCOVAs or MANOVAs in SPSS. So um, because of this, I kind of just made a condensed lists of the things that you would want to know for these tests. Um, rule of thumb for every single test that we run in this class, you need to know the assumptions, right? So the number of variables, types of data, types of samples are, you know, between or within subjects. And if there's any special tests um, that have to be run as, as part of like correction factors. So for one way ANOVAs, we said if we didn't um, meet the homogeneity of variance assumption, we would use Welch's test. Uh, if we didn't meet the assumption of sphericity, we looked at the greenhouse geyser adjustment or the hewn felt adjustment, that type of thing. Okay. Um, number two, we need to recognize examples of each test in a research scenario. So this might be as simple as me giving you a scenario like I've done on previous exams and then just asking you information about what the like what the variables are like what's the independent variable what type of data what's the dependent what type of data um, based on 
what you see, what type of test would you run and then just like cut it off there. Okay. Um, so it could be as simple as that. It could be that we elaborate a little bit more. I ask you those types of like introductory questions and then we follow up with an output, which you'll get practice with on the activity this week. Okay, so you don't need to know how to run these in SPSS, but you should be able to interpret the output. And I actually think this is a little bit nicer because I have to label stuff in the output. So um, we'll get some good exposure to how the labeling works. Um, and then same thing as previous ones, just know, know your null hypotheses, okay? Um, for the, both the main effects and the assumptions, for the most part, we're adding a few assumptions today, but um, you'll see like for the MANOVA examples, a lot of the assumptions that you already know about one and two way ANOVAs just magically apply to MANOVAs, which is great. Um, but yeah, and then understanding p-values, which you guys are like pros at now, so. Okay, let's go over ANCOVAs first. Um, primarily, we wanna know when to use an ANCOVA, the assumptions, and then any alternative tests if our assumptions are violated. Just to give you an idea of where this is in our flow chart, we're still operating with a single dependent variable that is parametric, so our ratio or interval data. We will have um, an independent variable that is non-parametric or nominal in our cases most of the time. And then um, you can see that we're kind of tracking this direction um, in terms of like previous, um, previous examples are factorial ANOVAs, we had two or more independent variables. And I feel like those examples were pretty solid and um, for the most part, pretty easy to grasp. When we work with covariates, this is the flow chart that the book likes to give us. And it says that when we use a covariate, we're considering the covariate as an independent variable. However, this can get confusing sometimes because the covariate is a measured variable and can often be confused with a dependent variable. So, I put a star next to this because according to like how the how the book defines um, covariates, they technically are independent variables. Um, and we'll discuss why, because there's a, a little bit later more in depth, because there's a regression component to ANCOVAs. Um, but in terms of leveled independent variables, like where you have a control group versus a training group versus another training group. In terms of leveled independent variables, there usually is at least one. Typically it's gonna be a between subject variable, but there are chances that it could be a within subject. Um, and we'll go over some examples of those as well, but kind of take the, the two or more independent variables kind of loosely. There's usually at least one leveled independent variable and then the book considers the covariate as another independent variable. So if we have a covariate, we do an COVA or analysis of covariance. So based on that, I think it's a good thing to point out what the heck a covariate is, right? Um, so it's a variable that might account for differences observed in the dependent variable based on independent variable manipulation. What does that mean, right? This means it's going to be some observed or measured variable. So it'll be parametric or ratio or interval data in nature, which is often why it's confused with a dependent variable. Again, it's similar to an independent variable, but it's not an independent variable with levels. And it does in some way affect potential dependent variable outcomes. So. A covariate is kind of a variable of its own class, if you want to think about it that way. Um, again, parametric in nature, so it's something that's measured. But usually we say that it's 
we're controlling for the covariate or um, we're accounting for differences between groups using the covariate. So that's kind of the wording that you might want to look for when we have certain questions. And again, I've, I've got some examples for you guys so you can at least be exposed. Um, but typically what we do is if we wanted to collect a big sample and um, maybe we didn't specify certain in inclusion or exclusion criteria, we just wanted a lot of people, um, then we can use a covariate and measure that covariate information on individuals and then use it to make groups more comparable to each other. So um, a lot of times if we're doing within subject samples and we want a pretest post test situation, um, the pretest measurement could be used as a covariate. So we've had pretest post test uh, sample data sets in this class already. Um, and if we wanted to, that pretest could be the covariate or a baseline tests or whatnot. So it kind of helps to control your sample if you have it controlled for that particular factor in your inclusion or exclusion criteria when you accept people into your sample. Have I lost anyone yet? I hear no objections. So let's look at some examples and hopefully if nothing is making sense yet, it will make sense. Um, so here's a research question, right? What are the different effects of various antidepressants on depression when controlling for how long a person has been depressed? <laughs> I now realize this is kind of a sad example to use at this point in the semester, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so you can see this part right here. Am I able to highlight? <gasps> Is it going to highlight? It's definitely going to highlight in the exact same color that I have. That's totally fine. I'll just use my laser pointer instead. Um, okay, so this part here, when controlling for how long a person has been depressed, that is the type of wording that I will typically use in your activity or exam examples when we're hinting at an ANCOVA. Similar to like when we had regressions and I'm like, oh, you want to predict or you want to estimate a certain um, variable. This is this we're controlling for some other measured variable. Okay. In an ANCOVA. So from this example, most of you, I feel like have, are, are pretty sound on pulling out independent and dependent variables. So our independent variable would be the different antidepressant medications. Right, so the effects of antidepressants on depression, right? So maybe for measuring depression, um, which is our dependent variable, we could use a self-scoring depression scale, um, similar to what is used usually when you go into therapy or um, diagnosis sections to get, you know, depression clinically diagnosed at least, um, where you fill out like a questionnaire and it asks you about your behavioral or mood or um, motivational symptoms, that type of thing, okay? But um, this is fine and dandy. We could run, you know, or design like a T-test or we could design an ANOVA comparing different antidepressant medications on a person's depression or level of depression or their depression score, but the level of depression or the amount of time that they've been depressed or the amount of time they've been on the medication, right? There's a lot of different confounding variables we could probably come up with for this example. Um, for me, just, I just chose level of depression um, and I'm choosing to label or kind of list a, a measurable variable as the amount of time a person's been depressed. So that's um, what I'm pulling from this, this phrase here for controlling how long a person has been depressed, okay? So if a person's been depressed very, for a very short period of time, that could affect their responsiveness to an antidepressant. If they've been deeply, deeply depressed for a really long time, that might 
hinder their response, right? Or maybe we start out at a certain dosage and need to up the dosage, but given that this is research and um, we might just keep the, the dosage the same for all of our groups, we wouldn't be able to make those adjustments to see if they're actually working. So if we control for a person's level of depression or how long they've been depressed, then that kind of ends up allowing our groups to be a little bit more comparable. Okay, so for the null hypothesis of an ANCOVA, it's basically the same as an ANOVA, right, where we're trying to see if there are significant differences between groups. So in this case, we would say the type of antidepressant medication has no significant effect on depression. That first chunk of our null hypothesis should sound pretty familiar to this at this point, right? But we add on what we're controlling for, okay? So type of antidepressant medication has no significant effect on depression when controlling for how long a person has been depressed, okay? So you literally can take my phrasing and dump it back into your null hypothesis. Totally fine by me. Any questions on this example? I'll open the chat too. Okay. Um, just so I can gauge where you guys are, if you wanna use your participant responses, put a thumbs up or a yes if you're doing okay. Cool. Nice. And COVIDs have not scared people. That's fantastic. Okay. So let's do another one. Um, and this is an example of a pretest post test situation. You'll notice if you have the PowerPoint open, I have a hidden slide um, in the presentation that has another example, and I filled in the I'm pretty sure I filled in the answer for you guys, um, but just so you can have another scenario to read. Um, but this research question, uh, let's say, is what are the different effects of various stretching programs on flexibility when controlling for pretest flexibility? I think this was actually something I mentioned at the beginning of this semester, um, or we had a similar example, and I was like, "Ooh, covariates, but not yet." Um, so. Again, the study design, if we're using, we're assuming we're using independent samples um, because I said so right here. <laughs> and usually I will give you guys more information like I have done in the past um, activities where I say like, oh, the same people were measured more than once or different groups were measured for blah, 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 right? So we're saying we have independent samples, um, which is a between subject design, okay? And we want to know the effects of various stretching programs. So that would be our independent variable on flexibility, which we would use some tests to measure flexibility. It could be range of motion tests. It could be sit and reach, not the best um, measure of flexibility. Um, people with short arms like myself get discriminated against in sit and reach tests. So it's fine. But we'd have some measure of flexibility and that measure would represent our dependent variable. And then we have this last part when controlling for pretest flexibility, which same wording we used in the previous example, right? And pretest flexibility is our covariate, right? Still measured, it's a parametric variable. Um, my hair is stuck in my face. Um, still a parametric variable, but it has some weight in, in contributing to the outcome of the dependent variable, right? So if we have a person who um, is already super flexible before starting a stretching program, we can make them more comparable to someone who maybe is not a, like super flexible before also starting a stretching program. And then that case, we're using the covariate to make people more comparable to each other. You see how it works? So our null hypothesis for this particular research question would be that the type of stretching has no effect on flexibility when considering pretest flexibility. Right? So it's a very formulated independent variable, has no significant effect on the dependent variable 
when controlling for or considering the covariate, pretty much is how it goes. Um, so now let's explain what happens math-wise, um, which nobody likes to talk about. <laughs> um, but this might give you a little bit more information into why covariates are considered independent variables. Um, considered independent, yeah. Uh, and COVAs are a two-step process. Um, so we always have to check assumptions first to make sure that we can accept the results of the ANCOVA. But generally what happens is that you stick in um, information. We'll, we'll do this through the univariate test in um, SPSS. Well, if you guys were learning procedures, it would go through the univariate test. You don't have to know that. Um, but typically what you would do is you would say, this is my dependent variable. This is my independent variable and or between subject variable. And then here is my covariate. And what SPSS does in the background before it spits out your output is it first runs a regression analysis between the covariate and the dependent variable. So you'll remember when we have regressions, one of our parametric variables is an independent variable, which is contributing to the prediction of a parametric dependent variable. So that's why covariates are often referred to as independent variables in situations because they technically are an independent variable for the regression portion of the ANCOVA analysis. Okay. And so what we do with this is we say run the covariate and the dependent variable values through a regression, pop out a regression equation and then reevaluate or adjust all of our dependent variable uh, values based on the strength of the regression or the strength of the relationship between the covariate and the dependent variable. So it's almost like running a cross-validation um, analysis within it, 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 its own test, almost. Okay, but that's the way that we make our dependent variable values more or, or samples more comparable to each other. Um, so we do aggression analysis, which adjusts the dependent variable values according to covariate relationship, right? And then we can run an ANOVA for between group comparisons. Um, so this would be looking at either two different samples that you've collected or in the pretest, post test case, I know some people sometimes get confused with this. They're like, but the same person was measured, so it's a within subject design. And technically, you are correct. Um, however, <laughs> we still run it using the same procedures uh, for the ANCOVA. Um, we just acknowledge the variables as something slightly different. So um, just for the most part, if you have any other ANCOVA example in our class, it's going to be a between group comparison. If it's a pretest, post test, you know that the same person has been measured twice. But in terms of the analysis component, because the pretest is considered a covariate, it's not as much considered that the same people were measured twice, even though they were. Okay. So, ANCOVA two step process regression to adjust a dependent variable, and then we run the ANOVA on the new dependent variable values. Okay. Our assumptions are fairly similar to the stuff that we've had before. So we need normal distribution and random sampling. Um, when we have a between subject um, independent variable, we have to run homogeneity of variance. So that'll be taken care of with Levine's test. And then we're adding on two new assumptions. These two you will need to be able to read in SPSS and I'll show you how to do that in the next couple of slides. Um, so homogeneity of regression sounds very similar to homogeneity of variance, right? Homogeneity meaning same or equal. Regression meaning that we're going to be looking at the slope 
of the regression line between covariate and dependent variable measurements. Okay, and so basically for each group that we measure, let's say we had three different training groups, we want to see that the relationship between the covariate and dependent variable or the slope of that relationship is the relatively the same for each of our groups. Now, I do want to mention this um, because I inherited uh, data sets from a previous instructor. He didn't check this assumption the way it was supposed to be checked. And so um, some of his data sets don't actually meet this assumption, uh, in which case usually I try to comment or remember to comment on exams or um, your activities that if you don't meet the assumption for homogeneity of regression, just note that the assumption is violated, but keep going with the analysis. That way you can actually practice um, reading everything. Uh, but that's that's one of our new assumptions we add to an ANCOVA. And then the second assumption we add is independence. Um, and this is looking um, at if the covariate um, backwards, if the between subject variable or the the main uh, exposure inter intervention that we're trying to observe, does that variable have an effect on the covariate? Because we definitely want to know that the covariate influences the dependent variable, but we don't need mixing effects going on if we're using that covariate to control for the dependent variable um, or to make any adjustments in the regression analysis part. So um, each of these has their own null hypothesis, which we will cover, and hopefully those concepts will make a little bit more sense. In addition, um, I put asterisks next to these last two. They're not essential to list um, because I, I noted like sometimes we don't necessarily have a between subject sample, but we have a pretest post test situation. Um, so this one you don't you don't necessarily need to include. I'd be fine if you left it out as long as you have these first five. You're good. <laughs> Okay, um, and then this is just our variable information that we get from our decision tree. Okay, um, so let's go a little bit deeper into our assumption tests so that you guys know what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, um, so in the output, I how do I how do I note this? I usually will put homogeneity of regression assumption in the output if I um, am giving you one um, on an ANCOVA, and it'll be the first test that shows up in the output. So it's very very much in order of how you should read it, which hopefully is helpful to people. Um, but this is the test that comes out of the homogeneity of regression analysis. So this particular example, just so you have an idea of what these variables mean in here, this is a, 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 an example that was looking at the differences between sports. There was a rowing, a swimming, and a running group. And um, we wanted to know what the effect of those sports were on caloric expenditure. So that dependent variable CE, that's what it stands for. Okay, and I think I put this in the notes on your guys's um, PowerPoint. Um, and so what we're doing here is you can also see mass is listed as a variable that we haven't addressed yet. This is the covariate. So if we put this into like a research question, we want to know what the effects of sports or different sports are on caloric expenditure when controlling for body mass. And the idea behind this is that a person with a higher body mass has a higher caloric expenditure, likely because their BMR is, is higher, right? Or they have more tissue that burns through more energy. So, um, we would run a test in SPSS that would give us this 
type of output. And it's gonna be in the test of between subject effects area. What we're looking for is the interaction. Well, it looks like an interaction, very similar to a two-way ANOVA, but we're looking for the interaction between the independent variable and the covariate. And then very similar to all of our other assumption tests, usually we want the p-value to be greater than 0.05. So in this case, it's listed as 0.557. Um, in which we can accept the null hypothesis, which is saying that the regression slopes are fairly equal between the independent variable groups. So if I took um, the regression results between caloric expenditure and a rowing group, caloric expenditure and a swimming group, caloric expenditure and a running group, right? I would end up with some type of plot that looks like this. And we can see each of these groups has its own regression line. Our goal with homogeneity of regression is just make sure that the relationships that are shared between each of these sports and the covariate are actually like the same. Otherwise, if they were super, super different, we can't use that covariate to um, kind of make our samples more comparable to each other. Okay. Any questions on homogeneity of regression? Don't know, okay. All right. Then we can talk about independence. Um, and so what this is looking at is does the independent variable have an effect on the covariate? This test hands down confuses people like no other because we test independence by running a one-way ANOVA using the dependent, or not using, using um, the covariate as the dependent variable in the analysis. And we use the independent variable as the independent variable, right? But if you guys remember when you stick in um, your variables into a one-way ANOVA, it usually asks you what's the dependent variable, what's the independent variable. Um, and in our case, usually when I had students run this test, they were like, but the covariate is an independent variable. And I'm like, yes, you are correct. But in order to run this test, we have to treat it as a dependent variable because it's a parametric type of data. So, the way, because it's a one-way ANOVA, our null hypothesis is very similar to what we've seen before with the respect that we're saying some independent variable has an effect or null hypothesis has no effect on the inserted dependent variable. In this case, the dependent variable in our one-way ANOVA is the covariate. So we can adjust our null hypothesis accordingly and say that the independent variable has no effect on the covariate, which is something that we want. So we, again, assumption test, we want a p-value greater than 0.05. If we had a p-value less than 0.05, that would mean our group characteristics determine the co covariate values. Meaning that if we were comparing rowing versus running versus, I don't even remember what the other sport I listed was before, but, that would say that rowers have a different caloric expenditure than runners, right? And that the sport determines their caloric expenditure instead of body mass. So, um, or reverse that. If we're using that example, body mass was the covariate. So we would say that um, certain sports lead to a certain body mass. Um, which again, we're using to control for caloric expenditure. But if there's an effect of the independent variable on the covariate, that's gonna skew our results. Um, and then basically it's going to lead into issues when we try to apply that regression method to the dependent variable, because there's too many things that are potentially causing effects and then that reduces our chances of actually noticing a real effect. So. That's why this uh, assumption is important to test. But in the output, usually I will say independence assumption or independence by itself. Um, 
one way ANOVA independence, something hinting that it's an assumption and not the main ANCOVA. Um, because it is an ANOVA, we still have to meet homogeneity of variance for in order to kind of accept which or know which p-value we're looking at. And this is another point that confuses people is that when we run an ANCOVA, we also have homogeneity of variance that has to be assumed. This is not the one that applies to the main ANCOVA test. It is not the one that applies. So if I say, what's the p-value for the test of homogeneity of variance? Don't report the independence assumption Levine's test p-value, okay? Do not, do not do it. Illegal, okay? So in order to figure out which p-value we have to meet the assumption of independence, we do have to look at Levine's test still based on the mean. So in this case, we have equal variances, which would tell us to read the ANOVA table. In this case, we would say, the p-value for independence is 0.414, right? Which is greater than 0.05. Therefore, we can say we have met the assumption of independence and our independent variable has no effect on our covariate. If we were using the previous variables from the homogeneity of regression slide, this would be that sport has no effect on body mass, okay? If we uh, violated homogeneity of variance, we would read Welch's statistic, very similar to when we were running regular one-way ANOVAs. And then you would evaluate that p-value with respect to the null hypothesis the same way as we just did with this one. Okay. Any questions? Cool stuff. Okay. So now let's talk about the ANCOVA main effect. Um, remember, assumptions are different from main effects. That was a common thing that I tried to like warn you guys about <laughs> in my super, super long email before exam two. And then I still had some people get confused. So assumptions are different than the main effect. Remember the main effect or the main reason we run an ANCOVA is to see if an independent variable has an effect on a dependent variable when we control for a covariate, okay? So uh, if we run, again, this would be through the univariate analysis in SPSS, um, that's going to give us a Levine's statistic. This, that I'm putting it in an orange box too. This is the homogeneity of variance assumption for the ANCOVA. So when you're listing p-values for your assumptions, you have a p-value for homogeneity of regression. That will be in its respective area of the output and we would list that p-value. You'll have a p-value for independence, which is gonna be the result of the ANOVA table that's linked to the independence section of the output. And then you will have your homogeneity of variance. I skipped a slide, sorry. You'll have your homogeneity of variance p-value, which is going to be in the main effector and COVA section of the output. Okay, so this would be the p-value report for Levine's test for the homogeneity of variance assumption. Okay, yeah, all right. Then we can accept our test of between subjects, similar to how we would a regular ANOVA for the ANCOVA part of things. Okay, so if we're able to accept our assumption of homogeneity of variance in addition to independence and homogeneity of regression, then we can look at our independent variable, which is sport in our test of between subject effects table. And then we can see that the p-value is 0 0.003, in which case this is less than 0 0.05. So we would accept, or sorry, we would reject the null hypothesis and say that this is the same example that I had before. So we would say that the type of sport a person plays has a significant effect on caloric expenditure when controlling for body mass. I can say that again if you were writing it down. 
Okay, since the p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. And we say that sport has a significant effect on caloric expenditure when controlling for body mass. Okay. Similar to our one-way and two-way ANOVAs, if we have a significant main effect, we still need to look at post-hoc tests. So that's what this note is down here, right? If P is less than 0.05, look at post-hocs and then see which sports are different from each other. Okay. Um, we do have some special considerations. Um, ANCOVAs are not always the appropriate test, and this is okay. Usually, if your assumptions are violated and you think you can use a variable as a covariate, but it turns out that like homogeneity of regression violated, homogeneity of variance violated, independence violated, right? If you have any one of those assumptions, typically we just say ANCOVA is not the choice for these variables that we have collected. And we just have to accept it and we choose a different test to run instead. Okay, so um, in this example, right, where, where, what are the different effects of various stretching programs on flexibility? If we had no program PNF, and, uh, and static stretching. And we took, let's say we took a pretest um, value. What happened is I ran this uh, original, this was actually a data set that was given to me by the professor, which I'm really happy he gave it to me because I was like, bro, you can't even run this test, but this is an example you chose. Mm -mm. Um, but what ended up happening is in this test of between subject effects, um, you can see we're looking at an interaction. So this is our independence test. Uh, what happened is that we ended up getting a p-value less than 0 0.001, which is less than 0 0.05, which means we have a significant interaction. Okay. Oh, my bad. This is not independence. This is um, homogeneity of regression. I got super excited. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Independence would have been shown up as an ANOVA table. Not, this is also an ANOVA table. I hate, I hate statistics. I'm so sorry, you guys, it's really confusing. <laughs> but if we're looking at an interaction, we're, we're trying to see the also giveaway is that it says R squared at the bottom and R squareds are only associated with regressions. So that was a doi to doi moment for me. Um, but what happened is we ended up getting a p-value less than 0.05 for an assumption test. And for homogeneity of regression, if we reject that assumption, we're saying that our slopes are not parallel. The way that this guy used to test, um, the way he used to test this assumption, which isn't like the most valid way, is he would just say plot or make a scatter plot and find the regression line equation um, for each of the variables separately and then just compare the the B coefficient value. And if it's like super, super different, then we met the, like, if it's, if it's not different, then we met the assumption. If it's really different, then we violated the assumption. But as you can see, you can plot this information. The lines could look relatively parallel, but they can still violate the assumption. So that is a big, um, long explanation of why ANCOVAs aren't always the best test to use. Because um, you might think you have a good covariate, but it ends up not being a good covariate. So, um, yeah, that's why I was saying typically when we violate homogeneity regression in this class, if it happens, just mention that it was violated and then move on with the analysis because it is really hard to find sample data sets online, believe it or not. Um, one pro to running ANCOVAs though is that you have greater statistical power. So the reason why this happens is like because you have these extra, extra adjustments happening to the dependent variable values, 
Um, it kind of eliminates some of, some of the unexplained variants, which is typically in the denominator of the calculation for the F ratio. So if we have more, um, like remember regressions, like, like if we're looking at uh, the coefficient of determination or the covariance of the R squared value, that tells us how much variation um, we are expecting in the dependent variable based off of the relationship with the independent variable. So if we're able to define how much variance we can actually explain between differences between groups, that strengthens our analysis, which is why ANCOVAs are kind of desirable in some way, but again, not always the most appropriate test. Um, and the only way you can find that out is if you fail an assumption, pretty much. <laughs> okay. All right. Any questions on ANCOVAs before we skip through our MANOVA section? Yeah, I have, a, I have a quick question. So for the pros being more s statistical power, is that is is that talking about the ANCOVA or is that talking about the one-way ANOVA? This is talking about the ANCOVA. Okay, okay. Yeah. I was just saying, like, if you can't use an ANCOVA, usually the one-way ANOVA is your cop-out. And you just okay, have okay. to say, like, oh, we can't use a covariate to control for our people, so we'll just compare them like we normally do. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Manovas don't take super long to talk about. So I think we will make our hour mark. All right. Um, so pretty much you want to know the same things as ANCOVAs, but MANOVA stands for multiple or multivariate analysis of variance. And some of you may have been wondering, what do we use the multivariate test for in the general linear model analysis part of SPSS? And this is it. <laughs> okay. Um, which again, you don't need to know, but just filling in some blanks that might have been there. Um, all right. So up to this point, we've been working with one dependent variable the entire semester, one dependent variable. The only exception to that is when we had multiple regressions. Um, actually, no, no, even then, even then, we only, we had, we had a lot of parametric data, let's just say that. But still, we only had one dependent variable because that was the variable we were trying to predict. So we've had a lot of instances where there are multiple independent variables, but again, just one dependent variable. That goes for t-tests, ANOVAs, factorial ANOVAs, ANCOVAs, all of that stuff. The only difference between a MANOVA and any of those other tests is that you have multiple dependent variables. That is the simple truth of it, okay? So um, the number of, a rule of thumb that I like to use is the number of independent variables determines the type of ANOVA. Okay, number of independent variables tells you what type of ANOVA. So if you have one independent variable with two levels, we say it's t-test, which I didn't list in this list, right? If you have one independent variable with three or more levels, that's a one-way ANOVA. Two independent variables, two-way ANOVA, right? And we can we know we have differences between if um, we've got independent samples versus repeated measures or paired samples, right? But the independent variables tell you what type of test you're generally running. If you have multiple dependent variables, that tells you if you have a univariate test, which is an example of all of the tests we've run so far, or if you have a multivariate test. And then if you have a covariate and a lot of dependent variables, we call that a mancova. Which I, it's like, that's honestly my favorite one to say, because it sounds like man cave, and I think those are hilarious. It's like a sheet shed. Anyways, that's all completely off topic, but we don't, we don't even touch mancovas in this class, because that would be a lot. Um, 
So you don't have to worry about those, but just know that they exist. Um, so in terms of what type of variable dependent variables will be in MANOVAs, the same as before. They're still parametric scale, ratio or interval data. I think in some of our examples in the activities, you will have an interval data. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's joint angles of some sort. But still the same concept. It lies in, this, in the realm of parametric variables. So it still works for our analysis. Now, I did share um, a MANOVA flowchart. Um, that's in like the regular flowchart format that I've given you guys uh, for all the other exams. But these are the different in red. These are the different types of multivariate tests that you get from all of the different types of univariate tests we've already covered in this class. So generally the flow chart says we have a parametric dependent variable, right? And then if we followed like a two levels of a single independent variable, we have a t-test. Um, if you have multiple dependent variables for a t-test setup, you could just call it like an expanded t-test. Technically, it's not, you can't consider it an ANOVA, but generally I will say um, usually if people have a lot of dependent variables that have been measured, but they're running a t-test, they'll just run multiple t-tests, um, which totally have done. Uh, I did a research project with my dance science professor, and we were looking at, um, like, how body position and the presence of having external rotation at the hips or not um, impacted uh, pressure distribution as well as if it changed certain um, muscle activity. Um, I think we had like eight different muscles. So each of those muscles would have been considered a dependent variable, right? The pressure uh, sensing or if we're looking at um, postural sway in terms of like center of pressure uh, deviations in the anterior posterior direction versus center of pressure in the medial lateral direction. Those are also dependent variables. But we only had two levels of each independent variable, which would have been body position, would have been um, laying supine on a reformer versus standing, and our foot position, which was turnout in a first position um, in ballet, what we call it. So you just stand with your hips externally rotated versus a parallel position where your toes are pointing forward. All right, so we have two independent variables that have two levels. So technically we should be running a t-test because we weren't necessarily interested in the interaction effect between the two. Um, and so we ran individual t-tests for each of our muscles. So one t-test per dependent variable. That is totally fine. Um, and it's actually very commonly done in research is just running multiples of your univariate tests. Um, some people decide that if their dependent variables contribute to each other um, significantly, then they run all of their variables through the same analysis, which we then call a MANOVA. So, just know you have options in stats, which is usually why you would consult with a statistician if you were doing a project like this on your own. But just to show you, purple is our univariate test. If we have multiple dependent variables, technically the correct thing to do would be to run multivariate tests, which are in red. Okay. We do have assumptions that need to be met. If you have the PowerPoint version of this open, I have listed assumptions for you in the notes section for nearly any possible test that we have run so far, I think with the exception of t-tests. But t-tests, if you have 
a between subject sample, it's homogeneity variance. If you have a within subject sample, you're looking at that correlation coefficient. Okay. But pretty much MANOVAs are going to adopt the assumptions of their base test. Right. And again, it, I think one of your examples in the review activity is an expanded t test. You can make a note of that now. I'll probably try to remember to mention it next week. Um, but it doesn't have to be an ANOVA, it could be a t test. Right. But if you think one way ANOVAs have normal distribution, random sampling, um, homogeneity of variance, they need to have uh, independent samples, right? One parametric or one non parametric independent variable that has three or more levels. And in this case, if we're running a MANOVA, we would call it like an independent samples, one, one way MANOVA basically, if we had a between subject group, if we had repeated measures, we would call it a one way repeated measures MANOVA. Right, so the, literally the only thing that's changing is a letter, which is M, okay. But you keep all of your same assumptions of that base test, and then you add two assumptions on top of that, neither of which we are interested in testing in this class. Um, I generally just let you guys skip over these. One of them, multivariate normality, we can't, we don't even have the ability to test in this class. It's not able to be tested in SPSS. Um, but basically what it does is usually with our normality tests, we make a two-dimensional bell curve where we say, um, how does the how do the frequency distributions line up for this particular variable? And do they look normal where most all of our data points are within two standard deviations from the mean? Instead of a two-dimensional bell curve, a multivariate normality creates a three-dimensional bell curve, which is like super complex to create. Um, and then you have to meet not only your two-dimensional normality in terms of like, how does uh, do you have a normal distribution for each of your dependent variables, but you combine all of those together into this big three-dimensional bell curve. So it's super complicated and we just, we don't do it in this class. Just list it as an assumption and call it a day, pretty much. Um, for homogeneity of variance covariance, I want to note this is not the same as homogeneity of variance. So if you have a between subject sample, you still need to list homogeneity of variance as one of your assumptions. And then if it's a MANOVA situation or a multivariate test situation, you have to also add homogeneity of variance dash covariance, okay? So what this does is it looks at the correlation between the dependent variables, and it sees if that is the same for all of the groups that you are measuring. Um, you might notice on your uh, outputs that I give you. I, I tried to delete these, um, but I do know in the flow charts, I kept them in from previous semesters, it'll be listed as boxes test. And that's what tests the homogeneity of covariance. Um, and again, it's just looking at the homogeneity of variance for all of the dependent variables combined together. So we don't look at this, you're just listing it in your assumptions test. We call it homogeneity of variance covariance because homogeneity of variance does play somewhat of a role in how the covariance is measured. So typically we would say if we the boxes test gives us a p-value for homogeneity of covariance, if that assumption is, or if that p-value is less than 0.05, we would typically look to homogeneity of variance to see which, um, which which variable is kind of screwing up our analysis, okay? So that's why we combine these two things together and we call it homogeneity of variance dash covariance. So not homogeneity of covariance, not the homogeneity of variance, variance covariance, okay? Um, in terms of how the MANOVA test works, again, very similar to our regular base ANOVA tests, but we add a step onto the beginning. So 
the test does a multiple regression and it makes a composite dependent variable, which the book refers to as a virtual variable. Um, and then we can treat that virtual dependent variable um, in terms of like how we would interpret the p-value for a multivariate test. Um, we, we would say like, does the independent variable, in some cases you have multiple independent variables, does the independent variable have an effect on this virtual dependent variable? Okay, and what happens is when we run that through a multivariate test, we get what's called an omnibus F ratio. I love the word omnibus. It just sounds like so bougie. Anyways, we get an omnibus F ratio. And as you know from previous um, ANOVA table examples, when you have an F ratio, you have a P value, right? Because that F value is being compared to some critical value in some F table. And that tells us what our P value is, or if um, the differences that we notice amongst this virtual variable, amongst all of our independent variable levels, if that difference is significant or not. So when we interpret this omnibus F ratio, the null hypothesis is that there are no significant differences between independent variable groups for the virtual dependent variable. This is one of the very few cases that you could use the word virtual dependent variable if you want to. Um, I listed the research hypothesis in an alternative way that you could word this. Um, research is mutually exclusive to the null. So the independent variables have a significant effect on at least one of the dependent variables. That's one way you can interpret it, okay? Um, so if we were to change this wording into the null hypothesis, you could say that the independent variables or variable variables, depends, have a, uh, do not have a significant effect on at least one of the dependent variables if you were rewording this as the null hypothesis, okay? But if we get a p-value less than 0.05 for our omnibus F ratio, we accept the research hypothesis, okay? And then, and then that's our multivariate test. Then we have to look into Right, this is very similar to how we interpreted um, our regular one-way ANOVAs before, right? If we know there's an effect on at least one of the dependent variables, then we have to dig into our univariate test to figure out which, um, which of our dependent variables there is a significant effect on. So that's why I put a note down here, the p-value for the omnibus re F ratio does not prove causality. It just tells us a difference exists. We have to dig in to find out more. So if you want kind of a step-by-step -step on, you know, how do we run a MANOVA? When we look at the omnibus F ratio, if F is not significant, meaning that P is greater than alpha, right, or P is greater than 0.05, our analysis stops because that means that when we combine all of our dependent variables, our independent variable or variables did not have a significant effect on any of our dependent variables. If there's no effect to be investigated, we don't have to look any further into the output. However, if our omnibus F ratio is significant, meaning P is less than 0.05 or less than the alpha we decided to set, that means there's at least one significant difference or one significant effect on at least one of the dependent variables. So that means we need to look at our univariate tests and the interpretation of these is exactly the same as the test you guys have looked at before, okay? So literally all we're adding is this step at the beginning and your interpretation of everything following is the same as what you've been doing for the last three or four weeks. Okay, so when we look at univariate tests, now we're just looking at a single independent variable and a single dependent variable. And we wanna know, is there an effect between the two of you? If you have multiple independent variables, you'll also have an interaction effect, right? As well as your two main effects. So like I said, it's the same as the base test. 
the univariate tests are the base tests. Everything that you guys have done to this point follows in this little part here, okay? So if you don't have a significant difference between your independent variable groups for a given dependent variable, no effect is present for that independent variable and you would stop the analysis for that variable. If you did have a significant difference between your independent variable groups, so let's say we're looking at a main effect, we got a p-value of less than 0.05, what do we usually do after that? We look at post hoc tests, right, or pairwise comparisons. Same process, okay? So to put this in perspective, we can look at a practice problem. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so um, the hodge, uh, homogeneity, oh gosh, he's the word, homogeneity of variance and covariance, we uh -huh. just need to be able to find that on the assumption, or on the, um, do we have to find that on the uh, SPSS, or do we just have to write that down as an assumption for the test? Just write it down as an assumption. Okay. Same thing with multivariate normality. Got it. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's slide through these last few slides, I think. Pretty much all of this is output. And I give you guys some extra practice problems at the end so you can kind of sort through some examples. Um, but our scenario, this would be something similar to what I would give you guys in uh, an exam or an activity, <laughs> okay? You're interested in seeing if individual or class training has an effect on RBFC, um, which is something we've used before, but it's basically body fat composition, okay? Um, VO2 and stress. So I think from that, we can already see that training is our independent variable, right? And then RBFC, VO2, and stress are our dependent variables or things that we're measuring. Each participant is randomly split into one of the three groups. So that tells us we have a between subject design and undergoes each of the tests to obtain measurements for RBFC, VO2, and stress, okay? Um, Beep, 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 beep. Undergoes each of the tests, meaning that we're going to test each of these three variables, which are dependent variables, right? Um, but still separate groups, okay? And those are going to be based on, um, in this particular example, I gave three levels of training program, which are not included on here because it made it too busy. Um, but I think I wrote it in your notes section. So three levels being individual training. So just the person on their lonesome self, you know, class training. And then there's a control group that didn't train at all. Okay, so this would be a classic non-parametric independent variable, three levels. Our um, dependent variables we said are RBFC, VO2, and stress. Right, so those would be ratio type data because they, again, are measured. Um, where zero would be the absence of a value or an absence of a measurement. We don't have any covariates because we're not explicitly saying that we're controlling for any one type of variable. So if we have a single independent variable with three levels and multiple dependent variables, we go back to our flowchart right, non-parametric, one independent variable, three levels. We said we had a between subject independent variable, multiple dependent variables. We are running a one-way independent samples ANOVA. Okay. And so our assumptions of this test would be all of the assumptions that we would use for a regular one-way ANOVA and then we just tag on the multivariate normality and the homogeneity of variance covariance, which I think in the note section I typed wrong. Um, so just double check if you're in the PowerPoint and I'll 
I'll update the slides for anybody who doesn't attend lecture today. Um, but in the notes, I put the assumptions for you guys. It's homogeneity of variance, covariance. Okay. All right. So we figure out what our variables are. And then I give you guys an output. The first thing we look at is the multivariate test results. This entire semester, I said, oh, ignore that. You don't need to look at that. Mm -mm -mm. Now you do. <laughs> okay. And in the multivariate test, we're going to look at our independent variable effect, right? Because we're if we had multiple independent variables, there would be multiple main effects plus an interaction effect that we would create this virtual dependent variable for. And then we say, is there a difference or not? Okay. What we do in this class, there are three different, uh, I want to say, I don't know what word I want to use. They're they're reliable or they're the most used multivariate tests, I guess. And there's different advantages for using each one based on the type of sample you have. Usually they come out to the same value. Um, the professor who taught this class before me used to average the three, the three values and I just kind of stuck with that. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so the Pelais Trace, Wilkes Lambda, and Hotelling's Trace, yeah, the great names, they're the first three that show up in the multivariate table, but you're going to average the p-value for all three of those in the multivariate test table. And that will give you the p-value for your omnibus F ratio, okay? So, Again, the results of the multivariate test tell us if the independent variable has an effect on at least one of our dependent variables. So in this case, P is less than 0.05, which means we need to look at our univariate tests. So we would scroll down in our output, and then we would say, well, if we are looking further into this, we need to make sure that we've met our assumption. We said, that we have um, a one-way independent MANOVA. So that means one way or between subjects. Um, we need to check for our homogeneity of variance, which is looked at through Levine's test. But we need to meet that assumption for each of the dependent variables. So in this case, there are three p-values to report for Levine's test, okay? So when we look at just the body fat composition, we can say that there are equal variances between our independent variable groups, right? And touching, it's greater than 0.05. So we've met the assumption for that dependent variable or for that univariate test. Then we can look at VO2. Again, p-value is greater than 0.05. So we can say we have equal variances between the independent variable groups. We've met that a homogeneity of variance assumption for that univariate test. And then for stress, this is not, this is not okay. We have violated homogeneity of variance. So in this case, um, we kind of just have to stop analyzing the stress um, data because there isn't a correction provided in SPSS. What we would have to do instead, and I don't do it in this example, um, what we would have to do instead is create a different test, run a regular one-way ANOVA with just stress as the dependent variable so that we could apply the Welch's adjustment, um, in which case we would accept the Welch's p-value um, and judge stress based off of the Levine statistic for that particular analysis run through. So, um, yeah. If you, if you don't meet the assumption, again, just say that it's violated and then stop analyzing that particular dependent variable for the case of MANOVAs. But I usually try to make sure that I check um, your guys' outputs prior to giving them to you. And if there's any issues, usually I remember to say something. If not, and it's an activity, just like holler at me and I'll fix it or I'll let the class know. And then you guys get a free answer. So we have met homogeneity of variance for 
our RBFC dependent variable and our VO2 dependent variable. Then we can look at our univariate test results. So in terms of training, it'll be listed as the independent variable over here. And then for each dependent variable, you have um, your p-value. Okay. So this is telling you what the main effect is for um, training on RBFC. Is there an effect of training on VO2? And loosely, is there an effect of training on stress? But again, typically we would want to say, let's run a different um, ANOVA because it, it violated uh, homogeneity of variance. So based off of this, um, this output, we can see that training has no significant effect on RBFC and no significant effect on VO2 because both of the p-values are greater than 0.05. If for some reason, like stress, let's say that we did meet the assumption for homogeneity variance for stress, this p-value is less than 0.05, right? So in this case, we would want to look at post hoc tests for stress. Right, but again, we didn't meet the assumption, so we would have to do this process in a different um, ANOVA. Um, some other notes. Alternative to MANOVAs, you could just run multiple regular ANOVAs for each dependent variable. Um, this is something that I'm actually doing for a long jump study I was working on um, before COVID decided to ruin my research plans. Um, but we, we measured different types of attentional focus cues and different timings of cues. Uh, so it's a motor learning study, if any of you recognized attentional focus from 312. Um, but we did different attentional focus cues and timings of those cues. And then we measured muscle activity, we measured force, we have kinematic data. Um, we looked at projection angle, right? And we can run technically all of those things I just listed are dependent variables. Um, but instead of running a MANOVA, I decided to run multiple regular ANOVAs for each of those um, dependent variables separately. Okay. And then lastly, the small problem in doing what I'm doing and running multiple ANOVAs is that you could potentially increase type 1 error because for each ANOVA you run, there is an inherent amount of error um, or type 1 error specifically that is included in the test. And if you just keep multiplying that error by however many ANOVAs you run, that's a lot of error in the end. So, um, it's a slight issue doing this, but running multiple ANOVAs is actually it's very widely practiced in literature. And I think there's an example of this in uh, a couple of the articles that I posted for you guys for your activity. So you'll be able to see an example of that. I also gave you guys two other examples um, within the lecture and I give you the, do I do that? Oh, wait, are these the same? This exercise program too. Um, it is a different example. Um, but I give you the answers in the notes section. Uh, just make sure, again, both of them are MANOVA examples. So make sure you, I, I wrote bad on me. I said homogeneity of covariance. Just make sure it's homogeneity of variance covariance. I'm going to do that right now so I don't forget. And then to wrap things up, let's talk about evaluating scientific literature. Yes, boo. It's not second dinner time yet. Um, so when we look at literature, we want to look at the methodology, figure out what the, what the variables are that people are using, and then figure out um, usually it's reported what statistical test was run, but we need to make sure that that test was actually appropriate, right? So um, actually this semester, 
we've had in my journal club, we've had a lot of examples of data that was not normally distributed. And there are certain um, there are certain types of tests that you can run when your data are not um, parametric, meaning they're not they don't match uh, a normal distribution. So we don't cover those types of tests in this class. I'm I basically taught myself stats <laughs> when, when I was told I had to teach this class and I'm learning so much like so many things that we don't even touch on in this class. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, so we have we look at we look at the methodology, we criticize it. Did they are there any threats to internal validity? Are there any threats to external validity? Right? Remember that those two things are different. So internal validity is looking at the innards of your study, right? Do you have any um, confounding variables that are going to influence the effect that you're trying to show, right? Due to your exposure, or your intervention. So that's one part of it, right? And then we also have to look at external validity. Does this study, is it generalizable to the population that was targeted with the research question? And I want to make a very, very, very um, a short comment on that. Because in past semesters, I've asked individuals or like I've asked the students like, what are some limitations? What a, you know, like, what do you think could be improved on in this? And when they comment on threats to external validity, they're like, gender, age, um, they didn't have the same BMI or weight or limb length or something along the anthropometrics end. And that's, it's not, these things are not always something that need to be commented on, right? If the aim of my project or the aim of my research is to target adolescents, right? I need that age group to be an adolescent age group. In other words, it wouldn't benefit me to generalize my results to other age groups because those aren't age groups I'm interested in. So it's important when you read through kind of like the introduction section, usually there will be uh, like the last paragraph or last two paragraphs are gonna be on what the aims of the project are, what the objectives, what the hypotheses are that the researchers think they're gonna find based off of existing literature. And so based on those aims, that is, that is their target, right? If they chose a certain population for a reason, they chose that population for a reason, right? Or the way that they sampled their people was done deliberately if they wanted a particular age group. So mentioning gender, if you know you don't have equal number of male and female, does gender really make a difference? And you can argue that it does, but you just have to justify why if you're gonna use that one as a threat to external validity. Um, gender could also be a threat to internal validity. It just depends on the variables that you're measuring. Um, but just to note, those are like the three main categories that people try to argue. I'm like, but does it make a difference? So you have to pay close, close attention to the aims of the project. Okay. Um, when you're listing limitations, right, and usually these are listed for you, or the, the um, researchers have done some of the digging in this area already, and they list these at the end of the discussion or conclusion section. A lot of times limitations are sample size. Um, maybe it was a pilot study, maybe they had a hard time recruiting people and, you know, like the study could be replicated. Maybe the design was really good, but it just needs to be replicated with more people so that we can know if the effects were real or not. Um, examples uh, in your activity, I give you guys uh, cerebral palsy, stroke, and Parkinson's examples because I'm in movement neuroscience. So everything is motor control related and neurological disorders that we look at in our journal club. So all right, if that's not what you like, but there is some biomechanics, there is some exercise physiology, and there is other obviously motor control principles that are kind of intertwined in all five of the articles that I posted. So hopefully you'll find one that's interesting. Um, 
But different limitations that you might be able to look at in each of these is disease severity, right? Kind of the same as our depression or level of depression example is like, how severe is a person's disease and does that is that severity addressed in the methodology? And does that severity potentially um, have an effect on the outcomes and in a way that that severity of the disease wasn't addressed in the inclusion exclusion criteria? Okay. Um, another thing that's really big that usually comes up in our Parkinson's talks, um, at least for this semester, we've been talking a ton about Parkinson's disease, um, is medication doses. Right. And some of the examples I give you guys, the patients are in an on med state or they're in an off medication state. Right. The time between medication, there usually needs like a washout period. Right. But if someone's getting like, I don't know the dosages of Parkinson's medication, but if they're getting like 500 milligrams versus someone else is getting 700 milligrams a day, like that's a big difference. OK. So. Medication dose is something to, to consider. The time of the disease state, right? How long have they had it? Are they progressing at a fast rate or a slow rate? How does the disease state have an effect on their fatigability? So if you're looking at balance tasks um, or cognitive motor tasks, right? Do they Do these individuals have ample rest periods so that their brain can like take a break, but also so that their bodies can take a break. Because people who have movement disorders, a lot of times if they have slowed movement or trouble initiating movement, um, in general, their musculature, like in stroke patients or cerebral palsy patients where their muscle tissue isn't um, as, uh, it's not as strong in terms of like contractile strength because of certain properties, right? Stroke patients, they it's a like um that affects their connectivity through their spinal cord, right? And a lot of times you get paralysis as a side effect of stroke. So that means they can't activate their muscles to a certain extent. Um so you know, like how does fatigability change as a result? Um, also consider learning effects. That was one of the internal validity threats that we had mentioned before. Usually when we criticize literature, we are assuming that there is no investigator bias and there is no instrument error. So those two we're kind of leaving off the table when you're commenting on limitations, unless their methodology is just like, mm, mm -mm, you shouldn't have done that. You did not consult the right people. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think those are all the comments I have on this. So you guys, you guys can have fun with this. And then, um, I think on your exam, I usually just give you some random research idea and then leave it wide open for criticism. So you can just shoot it down. Um, but any questions on, on this topic? Yeah, so for the first bullet point or like little slash mark, that would just be figuring out like if you should use like a Manova or like a an or Ancova or something like that, right? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. So this, uh, in your guys' activity, what I do for each of the articles is I say like, what's the independent variable? What type of data is it? What's a dependent variable or dependent variables? Actually, most of these articles have a lot of dependent variables. But then I ask you what type... Um, what type of deep or type of data is a dependent variable? What were the stats that were reported? And then I ask you, like, do you think these were appropriate tests to run? And based on the information that you've pulled out on the variables, you can weigh in based on what we've talked about in our class so far. Um, okay. Yeah, but usually it. Uh, other things that we comment on or that we've commented on in my journal club are like filtering processes, which we don't really care about in this class because that's not something that everybody is super familiar with. Um, but 
usually I, I, I give you guys like an opportunity to list like at least two limitations that you think apply to the methodology. If there's something they didn't consider, it could have been something that they mentioned um, in their limitations section. So no study is perfect. You should always be able to find something that's wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to stop recording then.